The idea behind the American Colonization Project was a mixed one. You had people like Robert Finley, who you mentioned, was a reverend, who believed, who's a northerner, liberal, uh, open-minded man, uh, believed that African Americans in the United States were getting a raw deal, not being served very well. He kind of came up with this idea that we need, that, that there, would, there was no way that black people would be able to get a, a, a fair deal in America. And that the best option for them was to go back to a, go back to a land uh, that they could call their own, that they could govern over themselves. So he was one side of the equation. People like him, northern evangelicals, Christians mostly, uh, who felt that this was a noble cause. On the other side, you had people like Thomas Jefferson, who these were sort of uh, progressive-minded planters. They owned slaves. But many of them felt that slavery was a doomed institution, that it wasn't going to last. It didn't make economic sense. It, it just wasn't fated to survive in the modern world. And, but he also believed that, again, African Americans could not live among whites, that the two races were so very different that they had to be separated. At one point he had said that, you know, when the Romans liberated their slaves, it was one thing, the ancient Romans because they were of the same race. But he said, we have a, we have a, a greater problem. Uh, we can't integrate these two races. Um, then there was also, among planters like him, uh, many of them wanted to liberate their slaves. Many of them were influenced by the ideals of the American Revolution, all men are created equal. Um, now these were, granted, this was a small minority of progressive-minded slave owners. Most slave owners had no intention of releasing their slaves. This was the natural order of things, this is where their money was being made, they weren't going to release them. But there was a small group of progressive slave owners, particularly in the Chesapeake region of Virginia and Maryland, uh, who felt that, yes, we need to free our, our slaves at some point. But the racist assumptions of the day was that they couldn't stay here. Um, in fact, many southern states, many southern states passed laws that said, if you free your slaves, they got to leave. They got to get out of here. We're not going to, we don't want this growing free black community. And in fact, the free blacks were the fastest growing community in the early republic. They were the, their population was growing very rapidly and it worried people um, for racist reasons and also for practical reasons. And so the idea grew that we needed to, to get them out of here. And so a bunch of these slave owners, these progressive minded slave owners, along with these northern evangelical liberals like Robert Finley, met in Washington, D.C. in, in uh, 1816, uh, in December, and they created the American Colonization Society. And the thing about the American Colonization Society was this was not a fringe group. This was the movers and shakers of Washington, D.C. These were the power brokers. Some of those powerful men in the land were there because the abolitionists who get the we, we hear their, their, their heroic story of fighting slavery. They were a small radical fringe group that was not widely appreciated or accepted in Washington, D.C. This was the mainstream consensus. This was the conventional wisdom. Get, we, if we're going to free the slaves, we've got to get them out of America. They don't have a right to be here. And so the American Colonization Society was founded on that principle. The man who presided over that meeting was nobody less than Henry Clay, who was the speaker of that U.S. House of Representatives, the second most powerful politician in America after the president, chaired the meeting. And Monroe, the president, uh, who became president shortly after the meeting, uh, was a paid-up member of, his, of the Virginia Auxiliary of the American Colonization Society. So this was, this was not a fringe group. This was mainstream, powerful politicians behind this. Abdurrahman faced the agony of parting from those he loved most. The morning of my departure was beautiful, clear, and calm. As we set to go, 
I told my children of my care for them, and that I would buy them free at ten prices. I was told there was a look of silent agony in their eyes. I could not bear witness to this. Andrew Marshall. And so people succumbed again to malaria, yellow fever, and other diseases that these people had no immunity to. So they suffered immensely. The death rate in early years of Liberian settlement is among the highest in the world. Uh, and of course they faced the ongoing hostility with the native peoples there, who even though they, they saw these settlers, they said, well, they're, they, they're, they look like us, but they dress like Westerners. And it's not surprising that the word that the natives gave to the settlers was the black white men. Because they're, they were, as far as the natives were, they were white, men in their habits, in their attitudes, in their customs, except they were black.
defeated our enemies and I hurried back with a few men to report to my father. Fearing my father's revenge, they dragged me and my men to the sea. They bound me, pulled off my shoes, made me go barefoot 100 miles, and led my horse before me. They sold me to slave traders on an English ship for two flasks of powder, some muskets, eight twists of tobacco, and two bottles of rum. Abdurrahman made a harrowing Atlantic crossing, unaware of what lay before him. The sea abounds with sharks of a very large size, which are often seen in almost incredible numbers about the slave ships devouring with great dispatch the dead bodies of the Negroes as they are thrown overboard. Alexander Falconbridge, ship's surgeon. All hands to the Halyard! The Africa was en route to the Americas to feed the New World's hunger for slave labor. This morning buried a woman slave, number 47. 
No, not what she died of, for she had not been properly alive since she first came on board. Captain's log, John Newton, slave trader. The slave trade was a very important part of the British economy. British ships at this time, the late 18th century, carried about half the slaves that were taken across the Atlantic. And in fact, after Britain and France went to war in the 1790s, Britain grabbed an even larger share of the trade, and by 1800, British ships were carrying 50,000 slaves a year across the ocean. There was an economic need, and the economic need in this case was you needed lots of labor to make these plantations work. Planters in the West Indies felt, as they put it at the time, it was cheaper to buy than to breed. This was a business. It was a very well-established business. It underlay uh, much of the British economy. It underlay all kinds of cultural institutions. The library at All Souls College, Oxford, was built with the profits from a, a slave plantation in Barbados. Um, Portman Square in London was one of the capital's most exclusive addresses. Six of the 13 families who had mansions there made their money from slave plantations in the West Indies. There was no thought that these slaves were human beings. So this was cargo. You start thinking of people as cargo, as units, uh, then they're not human. When you decide somebody is not fully human, whether it's a passenger on a slave ship or an inmate of a concentration camp or uh, <clears throat> a prisoner somewhere who's being mistreated, then there are no limits. And uh, then terrible things happen to people. This North Atlantic slave trade, which has been bolstered by two uh, factors, racism on the one hand and that Africans exclusively are being brought into this trade and capitalism on the other hand distorted and made slavery something qualitatively different and uh, exponentially more brutal than that was what was known in African societies. This was the largest forced migration in human history, draining away some 12 million people in 400 years. It was a trade that seemed to make the world go round, that was part of the world's economy, uh, but it was nonetheless something absolutely horrible. Stacked like cords of firewood inside the ship's dark hold, Abdurrahman and 170 other slaves crossed 3,000 miles of ocean before he was sold again. Abdul Rahman Ibrahim of Suri was born in 1762, son of Suri the Almani, or King of the Fulbe, a predominantly Muslim population of cattle herders that ruled the West African country of Futa Jalon, an area now part of the Republic of Guinea, from his family's traditional seat in Timbo, a town of airy, large-roomed houses surrounded by hedges and dominated by a large mosque. Economically, the Fulbe were traders acquiring salt and European manufactured goods, in exchange for the powers of full bay craftsmen, in exchange too for slaves, members of rival trades defeated in battle. 
As a prince, Abdul Rahman received a traditional Muslim education, beginning with learning to read and write passages from the Quran. His aptitude for his studies persuaded his father to send him abroad for further education, first to Messina in what is now Mali, then to Timbuktu. When Islam reached West Africa in the 8th century, Muslim historians began to write about West Africa as it spread throughout the area. Documents about the history of this region show Arab historians knew it as the Balad al-Sudan, the land of the blacks. The empires of Ghana, Mali, Songhai, Timbuktu, and Gao became the first sub-Saharan people to accept Islam early as 850 AD. Commercial centers provided the first places of worship as traders began to have prayer areas in the towns. These centers of trade invariably became symbols of African civilization, showcasing an Islamic learning dynasty. The community was governed under the Islamic Sharia system and scholars began gathering to share vast resources of knowledge. Al-Bakri, the Muslim geographer, provides an early account of ancient Ghana in his book, Roads and Kingdoms. He describes Ghana of 1068 as highly advanced. Al-Bakri writes, economically, it was a prosperous country. The king had employed Muslim interpreters, and most of his ministers and treasurers were also Muslims. The Muslim ministers were learned enough to record events in Arabic and corresponded on behalf of the king with other rulers. He gives the following picture of Islam in Ghana during that time. The city of Ghana consists of two towns lying on a plain one of which is inhabited by Muslims and is large, possessing 12 mosques, one of which is a congregational mosque for Friday prayers. West African griots tell the story of a woman named Buktu, who settled near the banks of the Niger early in the 11th century. She maintained a water well which became a social center and stopping place for caravans of travelers. A village was formed which was later named Timbuktu. A supreme judge named Sheikh Sidi Abu al-Barakat Mahmoud, who had visited Mecca and Cairo, ordered that a mosque be built. With the financial backing of a wealthy Mandekin woman, they designed a mosque featuring an inner court with the exact dimensions of the Kaaba in Mecca. It would become a leading center of education. Timbuktu had long been a destination or stop for merchants from the Middle East and North Africa. It wasn't long before ideas as well as merchandise began passing through the fabled city. Since most, if not all these traders were Muslim, the mosque would see visitors constantly. The temple accumulated a wealth of books from throughout the Muslim world, becoming not only a center of worship, but a center of learning. Books became more valuable than any other commodity in the city and private libraries sprouted up in the homes of local scholars. In addition to books, Timbuktu accumulated navigational maps and logs from geographers throughout the world. During the 10th century, stories began to surface of sailors reaching a distant land where he studied not only Islam, but also geography, astronomy, calculations, and the law. al -Qari. They had a constitution, they had laws. This was a very sophisticated uh, society. At 17, Abdul Rahman returned to Timbo, entered the army, and quickly rose to the rank of commander. It was during this period that Abd Ibrahima met a white person for the first time, 
John Coates Cox, a marooned Irish ship surgeon who was found ill and insect bitten and brought to Sori who provided shelter and care until Cox regained his health and returned to Ireland. His name was John Cox. He served as a ship surgeon on an English vessel. He had gone ashore and when he could not be found, his ship sailed without him. He fell ill and stayed for six months with the greatest hospitality. He was the first white man to reach Timbo. While Europe was in its dark ages, great civilizations developed in West Africa. Inventive, sophisticated nations that were both politically and economically astute. At the time of his birth, Abdul Rahman's beloved Futa Jalon rivaled any kingdom in its intellectual and spiritual development. The full base, they love learning. They love, they, they take pride in intellectual prowess. The early full base settlements lay along major trade routes in the lush islands of what is now Guinea more than 4,000 feet above the headwaters of the Niger, Gambia, and Senegal rivers. This fertile region attracted travelers from across Africa, who in turn left their mark on the local people. The Arabs, because they were nomadic people, they were always venturing out. So by the 10th century, you begin to get these movements into West Africa of uh, merchants, people looking for places to make money. Wherever Islam went, it's, it's always had this attraction to local people. For a time, Islamic culture flourished peaceably alongside indigenous beliefs. What would account for such a rapid spread of Islam in, in West Africa is that these were tribal communities. So if one person became Muslim, oftentimes if it was the tribal chieftain, for instance, the whole tribe would become Muslim. The devout, who came in the late 17th and early 18th century, were more organized and committed to bringing non-believers into the community of the faithful. Those who resisted, mostly animists, were increasingly unwelcomed in Futa Jalon, and many migrated away. Parce que le Futa on dit tout, mais il y a trois au Futa. Le Futa n'a pas eu comme eux en termes de beauté et de courage. C'est mon sourire. Le fils de l'Anambo Carbiro qui était le général de ses armées, Modi Agib, le fils d'Alpha Yaya qui était le général de ses armées, et, et, et Alpha Brahman Koin, le fils d'Alpha Brahma, le fils de Salut Kenobala Koin, qui a fait la bataille, qui a vaincu Yankewan. Finally, in 1725, Muslims founded the theocratic empire of Futa Jalon. It would rise to be one of the great kingdoms of West Africa, like Jenny and Timbuktu, under an elected sovereign and eight al-Mami who governed its nine provinces. Donc ça, c'est pour vous dire qu'il y avait une organisation au Fouta. Tenez compte, vous avez une capitale politique, vous avez une assemblée nationale, vous avez une cour suprême, vous avez une haute cour de justice et vous avez un nomas land où les gens pouvaient se réfugier au cas où ils commettaient des crimes, ils venaient à Kakalabé. Tout ça, nos parents l'ont fait. Timbo became its political capital for the next 170 years. Nous sommes arrivés à Timbo par une rue bonne. We arrived at Timbo and entered the city on the banana trees lined avenue. The rain surprised us at the very moment when the inhabitants were gathered at the mosques. Gaspar Théodore Molien. 1818. Uh, Timbo was at the foot of a mountain. It was a, a village of perhaps uh, five or six thousand people. The houses were mud wall, uh, conical, with sloping roofs. Uh, almost every house had a courtyard, and usually the courtyards were surrounded with hedges so that people walking the uh, streets and cul-de-sacs could mind their own business when they went by. Les hommes sont beaux, forts. They are handsome men, strong and brave. They are intelligent. They are mysterious and prudent. Antoine Golbery, West Africa, 1787. The Fulbi of Fouda Jalan placed great emphasis on uh, a couple of things. One was a great care of their hands. 
the other was uh, their hair, which they wore long uh, in braids, often down onto their shoulders. So that was their status symbol. And it's like a three-piece suit or a bow tie, you know, today in America uh, for an official ceremony. That was their dress code. Les gens sont riches. Toutes les femmes ont... The inhabitants are wealthy. All the women have silver jewelry, large golden earrings, and they wear togas in blue tie-dye. All signs of luxury among Africans. Gaspar Théodore Molien, West Africa, 1818. Beyond wealth and attractiveness, Le Futajalon's most precious asset, this was a nation deeply rooted in spiritual and intellectual pursuits. This was a theocentric or theocratic society. Power rested with Allah. The chief, the temporal chief, was just an instrument of God. And I think that uh, Islam amongst the Fobi was very important in giving them a very unique identity and reinforcing certain uh, aspects of their personality as a proud people, even amongst other West African Muslim uh, tribe. Futa Jalon scholars wrote the only version of the Quran in Pula, the local language, while other indigenous literature developed using the Arabic alphabet. There were schools in almost every town, and the kingdom became a magnet of learning for nations in West Africa. Education was Abdul Rahman's birthright. Because he was the son of a nobleman, it would have been absolutely necessary for him to be not only literate, but erudite, and so he becomes a student of knowledge. Islam is a very literacy-based tradition. Uh, there's a lot of learning that has to happen. One has to be taught the Arabic rudiments of Arabic to know the prayer and to learn to recite the Quran and to be conversant with the literature, the sources of the religion. At age 12, he was sent, uh, his father noticing his aptitude for this, decided to send him to the large cities of the East so that he could continue his education. This meant traveling about a thousand miles down the Niger River to the city of Jenna, which was a, an ancient um, sub-Saharan town, a market town of great consequence and a center of Islamic learning. We would consider it the Harvard of West Africa. This is where you went to sit with the, the cream of the crop. Those scholars would have held their ground in any intellectual circle in the Muslim world. Abdurrahman was a contemporary of Tjarno Muhammadu Samba Mombeya, who is the Shakespeare of Futa Jalon. He may have known the powerful verses and poems of Tjarno Samba, written in Pular, but entirely embedded in Islam. And it begins like this. Ya jom nanu gol, hedo ha la gorel, ja ingel lo ungel si afa la malal, iungel esa idu muhammaduel, selen ke lenyol fu tan ke laral, momben ke hodande elash ariyang ke to kape e malikiyang ke datal. Africa did produce men of learning. Africa did produce uh, civilized, highly civilized individuals and societies. Africa did produce men of dignity and principle. And I think this is one of the very powerful points that the life and times of Abdurrahman Ibrahim drives home for us. Yeah, Rahman and 56 others from the Africa's human cargo were sold for $4,090, less than $72 each, and transferred to the cargo hold of another ship, the Navarro, for a 2,600-mile journey across the Caribbean Sea to the Yucatan Channel, then north to Spanish rule New Orleans, and up the Mississippi to the river town of Natchez. I could see this was a big port and a big city but it looked smaller than Timbo. The buildings were not well built, like at home. 
As a rough and tumble town on the frontier, this being a jumping off place to the west, it also had that kind of frontier character. The people came here, they were going to make their fortune, and uh, this was the frontier. Eight months after his capture, the Prince of Futajalon stood on the Natchez docks with other goods for sale or trade. You, come on! Get going here! Get going! Come on now, come on! Saturdays were a big business day for the region, and local farmers headed to the docks to purchase the manpower needed to clear the wilderness. They were an unsophisticated bunch. Come, come look, come look, come look. Step up here, come, come, come. Most were illiterate, and they rarely paid in cash. Usually, they'd mortgage their purchases against future tobacco crops. Look at the backs on this one. Give me a bid. Any more bids, any bids, any higher. One of the farmers who had come to see what was brought to Natchez was Thomas Foster. Thomas Foster was a hard-nosed businessman, a hard worker physically, uh, religious-minded in his way, and very ambitious. Come on, open up, open up. I kind of think of him as a Calvinist. He was not a flamboyant fellow. He was out here trying to put together a place to live for his family and build his personal wealth. He had a very, I think, a predestinarian kind of view of what, where he should be. 930 is as high as I can go. 930. What you're essentially doing is you are removing the identity of an individual. 930 dollars. 930 dollars. So, so, too far in Africa. And you are giving him a very different identity, one that you, as a slaveholder, choose. And this communicates very effectively that the person is now a slave, the person is now chattel, the person is now someone who is owned. Sepan cuantos esta carta vieren, como yo, Thomas Edwin, I, Thomas Edwin, realmente y con efecto, a Thomas Foster, hereby sell to Thomas Foster two brute negroes for the sum of 930 pesos, y quedarán hipotecados hasta el entero, and they will remain mortgaged until they are paid for in full. For a little hard cash and two promissory notes, Foster purchased Abdurrahman and Samba, one of his soldiers. Foster had no idea who Abdurrahman was, nor did he care. His only concern was that the long-haired African with no apparent disease or injury would work his land and justify his investment. After the uh, purchase was completed, uh, Abarakman headed to the Foster farm. Foster was a native of South Carolina who had immigrated to the Natchez district uh, just a few years earlier. Uh, he had come with his mother and three older brothers. Uh, they had come because the Spanish government in trying to build up the population of the region was uh, giving grants of land uh, to people who would take and develop it. <laughs> we don't want to think of this as a plantation. It was probably just a few acres and fence, muddy with stumps and chopped down trees. I had seen at the market that Mr. Foster had money. I could scarcely believe that they had to live in the wilderness like this. Compared to the raw Mississippi frontier, there were a number of highly developed West African kingdoms, some as large as the American colonies. One of the most prominent was Futa Jalon. Headed by an Islamic al-Mami, a freely elected leader, who ruled from the capital of Timbo, a strategic trading center.
Floor planters examined the African captives on auction there on August Saturday in 1788, but only one of them, Thomas Foster, could pay cash. He purchased Abdul Rahman and Sambo, a fellow Forbes soldier who had served under Abdul Rahman's command. The two men were secured with rope and led to Foster's land in the Pine Ridge area, six miles from Natchez. For a little hard cash and two promissory notes, Foster purchased Abdul Rahman and Samba, one of his soldiers. Foster had no idea who Abdul Rahman was, nor did he care. His only concern was that the long-haired African with no apparent disease or injury would work his land and justify his investment. After the uh, purchase was completed, uh, Abarakman headed to the Foster farm. Foster was a native of South Carolina who had emigrated to the Natchez district uh, just a few years earlier. Uh, he had come with his mother and three older brothers. Uh, they had come because the Spanish government in trying to build up the population of the region was uh, giving grants of land uh, to people who would take and develop it. <laughs> we don't want to think of this as a plantation. It was probably just a few acres and fence, muddy with stumps and chopped down trees. I had seen at the market that Mr. Foster had money. I could scarcely believe that they had to live in the wilderness like this. Further indignities awaited him. In Futa Jalon, Abdul Rahman's long plaited hair had been a symbol of distinction. The plates were immediately cut though Abdul Rahman struggled so hard that he had to be tied to a tree. I don't want to hurt you, but I will if I have to. Come on. Come on. Come on. The first order of business for Thomas Foster was getting some new clothes and a haircut for his new African. Moving ahead! Stop! This meant, of course, cutting off the long hair that he wore, an ornament of great beauty in Futa Jalan. And... Uh, Abdul Rahman told a friend, and under normal circumstances in his own country, he would have parted with this, this hair only with his life. Here he is, sheared of his hair, which was a sign of their nobility, and forced into menial labor. This land was the Abdul Rahman's home for the next 40 years. A series of incidents quickly demonstrated that to Abdul Rahman the depth of his fall and the bleakness of the future he faced. Upon arriving at Foster's land, Abdul Rahman, probably communicating through another African from a neighboring plantation, offered Foster a ransom for freedom, a common strategy in West Africa. Mississippi planters are but a plain, practical body of men. They would rather gaze upon an acre of cotton than upon a magnificent garden. Still, planters are not devoid of taste. It is just to their desire to make it yield interest rather than beauty. Though not well educated, Thomas Foster was a shrewd businessman who capitalized on Abdurrahman's knowledge of cotton grown in Futa Jalon. Foster got into the cotton business early. The indigo was attacked by insects. The in the case of the tobacco, the uh, price supports were lowered, and uh, Foster was wise in moving into cotton. Abdul Rahman's familiarity with the crop enabled Foster to plant on a large scale, producing almost 16,000 pounds of cotton in his first year. The Fosters quickly became one of the leading cotton families in the area. As the farm swelled to a sprawling plantation, Foster purchased more slaves, paying this time with hard cash, and counting on Abdurrahman's natural leadership to get the most from his investment. I hereby sell to Thomas Foster without further obligation or mortgage, four slaves, all natives of the United States. Isabel, Isabella, 25 years of age. Jacob, 10 years of age. Anaki, 5 years of age. And Lamanique, 2 years of age. Prince, this is Isabella. She doesn't know nothing about cotton. 
I want you to show her how we work the fields here in Mississippi. Yes, sir. I show you how to work Foster's fields. First, you take the stick. Make it hold. You take the seed, cover it up. And Isabella, I see a woman, though bereft of most things, retain the ability to choose who she loved and who she wanted to be with. I can't minimize the force of her own personal will and dynamism and the force of their attraction for one another. Seven years had passed since Abdurak Man last saw his wife and child. He had given up hope of ever seeing them again. He had to overcome that love, that separation, then open up his heart to another who also could have been taken from him. It was a tremendous risk for both of them. To love in that kind of situation was risky. Father in heaven, you ordained marriage for your children. We present to you Isabella and Prince, who are here this day to be married. Marriage was not a legal right granted to slaves, but Foster believed that a ceremony would create a sense of stability on the plantation. For Abdurrahman, a Muslim, and Isabella, a Christian, the ritual was a testament of their love and commitment to each other. They made the best they could of their circumstances. They found ways to figure out forms of solidarity, forms of resistance, forms of accepting what was going on, including obviously religious forms of acceptance, uh, in order to live their lives. If you have faith, you will think that all of this happened for a reason, a reason that you, you don't know. But ultimately, things will get better. The world moved on. Abdurrahman rose to a position of authority on Foster's plantation, and Foster allowed him to earn money of his own by growing vegetables to sell at the market. He was the person who the other Africans looked up to because he was a leader there and he continued to be here and see that things got done and he wasn't made overseer, he was the de facto overseer. After all, a significant number of the slaves were his own family. Ultimately, there would be five sons and four daughters born to them. Each one of these children tied a heartstring between himself and the land of his enslavement. Hey, sweetie. I just know you're going to sell all these today. Maybe we could buy a little something for the children with the money. It's just another day at the market. But we'll see. Crossroads near Natchez Town was an open marketplace where it was acceptable for slaves and slaveholders to trade with each other. Fresh coffee, good Sunday dinner. Beyond the makeshift stalls, the two rarely intersected socially, except on Sunday, market day. Yes. Yeah. 
On one particular Sunday in 1807, an extraordinary event would shift the course of Abdurrahman's life James. once again. Fresh, yeah. Go to that man. See if he has one eye. If he does, I know him. One eye and black patch. His name was John Cox. He served as a ship surgeon on an English vessel. He had gone ashore, and when he could not be found, his ship sailed without him. He fell ill and stayed for six months with the greatest hospitality. He was the first white man to reach Timbo. Boy, where do you come from? I come from Foster's place. You weren't born in this country. No, I come from Africa. From Timbo? Yes, that is my home. And is your name Abdul Rahman? Yes, that is my name. Do you know who I am? I know you very well. You are Dr. Cox. potatoes and come to my house I cannot leave my potatoes I had not seen dr. Cox since I was a young man in Timbo he had many questions he asked how I had come to this country how I had come to Mississippi. How I had come to be a slave. <laughs> Dr. Cox was a free thinker, a respectable physician who was described by prominent residents of Natchez as a man of some eccentricity. Mr. Foster, is it? Yes. Pleasure to make your acquaintance. John Coates Cox. What is it, Mr. Cox? Dr. Cox? You have in your possession the one you call Prince. Many years ago, on the west coast of Africa, I was saved by an African prince, Abdul Rahman. Wait, wait, sir. You're saying my prince actually is an African prince? That's exactly right, sir. <laughs> and I never thought I'd be able to pay my debt until today. Sir, I am here to ask for the release of Abdul Rahman into my care. <laughs> I'm sorry, sir. Prince is not for sale. I understand that the going rate is $550 or so. Sir, you don't understand. So you Prince cannot... is not for sale. His wife is here. His children are here. I beg you, sir. I, I will offer help you, you Dr. Cox. $1,000. Prince is sir. not for sale at any price. But, sir... Good day to you, sir. It did become the talk of the town, and I suppose in some sense that it made Foster feel like he was the man who controlled a prince. I believe Thomas Foster rejected the offer because Abdul Rahman had simply made himself indispensable on the Foster farm, despite the cheer of the family, the confidence Foster had in him, and the friendship of Dr. Cox. He paid a very, very hard price for his accommodations. Foster prospered. His property expanded dramatically to 1,700 acres. Forty adult Africans now worked the plantation from sunup to sundown, making him richer with each season. Dr. Cox continued to seek Abdurrahman's freedom, but Foster flatly refused. When Cox died in 1816, his son took up the cause. But Foster stood firm. For years after Cox's death, people talked about the unlikely meeting between the Irish doctor and the African prince.
This notoriety opened doors to Abdurrahman that were closed to most black men. Alam Ayo Halahu Al Habib Al Kari Al Habib Show me what you just read. E Alam Ayo Halahu Al Habib And where did you learn to read Arabic? I learned as a boy in Timbo, in Timbuktu. At home, we spent much of our time devoted to studying the rites of prayer and to the Quran. We learned geography, astronomy, calculations, and the languages of the nations we traded with. <laughs> It was the first of my country's writing that I had seen since I left home. I know many languages. I told Colonel Marshak that I wanted to write a letter home. And did he know how to send it? Andrew Marshak had recently arrived from New York State. He brought Natchez its first printing press, and became its first newspaper publisher. Marshak had a nose for a good story and began printing articles that sometimes embellished and stretched the facts to call national attention to Abdurrahman's plight. He was a colorful personality, perhaps not an intellectual, but he was a friendly, open, uh, genuine person and usually uh, spoke first and thought later. Prince is really a most extraordinary man. Born to a kingdom, well-educated, he was faithful, honest, humble, and industrious. I do not look upon Prince or Abdul Rahman as a mere biped slave, but as a dignified captive, a man born to command, unjustly deprived of his liberty. Six years passed and Abdurrahman never wrote to his family in Futaj alone. But the shameful scandal on the plantation would finally motivate him. Thomas Foster Jr., we command and strictly enjoin you to answer to a bill profit against you for keeping the basest company of habits and temperance. Thomas Foster had a son, Thomas Foster Jr. He married well the daughter of a local minister, but uh, soon grew cold and indifferent to her, and she discovered why. Going around the quarters, she caught her husband, Thomas Foster Jr., in bed with a slave woman named Susie. Remarkably enough, it seems that this woman was the daughter of Abdul Rahman. He began to see this, the future, and the future was what was going to happen when Thomas Foster died, and his children were gonna be divided among Foster's children, and all that he had worked for in terms of stability and position for his family within that limited society was all going to be torn apart. Maybe writing a letter home doesn't solve that problem immediately, but it was a protest, uh, the strongest he could take, uh, perhaps, against the situation on the plantation. Natchez, Mississippi. The enclosed letter in Arabic was written in my presence by a venerable old slave named Prince. The object of his letter is to make inquiry after his relations with the hope of joining them. I have undertaken to forward his letter for him and committed to your care with a request that you will lend your aid to an old man's wishes. I am, sir, your servant, Andrew Marshall. January 12, 1828, Washington, D.C. Sir, your letters have been received. The President is obliged by your attention to the subject of the Moorish slave now in the possession of Mr. Foster. 
the object of the president being to restore Prince, the slave, to his family and country for the purpose of making favorable impressions in behalf of the United States. Henry Clay, Secretary of State. Because he wrote in Arabic, Mars Shark and the American government assumed that Abdurrahman was a Moor and sent his letter to the Sultan of Morocco, America's oldest diplomatic ally. Having finally caught the ear of Washington, Abdurrahman chose not to correct the mistake. By 1827, Abdurrahman was in his 60s and of little economic value to foster. After years of rejecting Cox's offers to purchase his freedom, Foster told Marshalk that he would release the prince without payment, on one condition. Be it known that I, Thomas Foster, have this day delivered unto Andrew Marshalk the custody of said slave prince, for the sole and only purpose of his being transported to his native country by the government of the United States. Prince is not to enjoy the privileges of a free man within the United States of America. Thomas Foster. Immediately a complication arose. If Abdul Rahman was going to be free, what about Isabella? He really couldn't imagine leaving her behind. Abdul Rahman began a campaign to raise funds to free Isabella from slavery. In two days, he collected $200 for his wife's purchase anticipating that it would be as easy to free his children as well. Henry Clay directed Marshalk to send Abdurrahman to Washington, and from there he would go to Morocco. Just before he left Natchez, Marshalk presented him with the costume of a Moorish prince. He hoped to use the strange gift to his advantage. Once again, Abdurrahman faced the agony of parting from those he loved most. The morning of my departure was beautiful, clear. Abdurrahman, a free man for the first time in 40 years, headed up the Mississippi River with Isabella by his side. The first stop, Cincinnati, Ohio. Impressed by the sights of this large and bustling city, it held a still deeper significance. For the first time in Abdurrahman's life, he was in a place where slavery was outlawed. Newspapers detailed Abdurrahman's Prince to Pauper story, and local events were organized around his visits. A bumpy stagecoach ride took them through Pennsylvania, Maryland, and later Washington, D.C. His hopes buoyed by the attention, Prince carried his subscription book everywhere, soliciting donations to free his family back in Mississippi. Secretary of State Henry Clay arranged for Prince to meet with President John Quincy Adams. May 15, 1828. Abdul Rahman is a Moor who has been 40 years a slave in this country. The Emperor of Morocco expressed a wish that this man might be emancipated and sent home. I should like to oblige the Emperor. Children, the President received me very kindly, and I expect from his kind expressions to me that he will pay every attention to my business. Fast becoming the most popular African in America, Abdurrahman played to the press, never denying some of the more colorful descriptions of himself or his life, at least not in print. The African prince, Abdul Rahman, at the insistence of several of the clergy, has spent a few days in this city to receive contributions. He has a striking face and a clear, intelligent eye. Irish prince, he expresses the deepest sympathy for his children who are still in slavery. Their emancipation would be paramount to every other consideration. Episcopal watchman, July 4. His visit is to avail himself to the benevolence of this community. The appeal, we are confident, will not be in vain. Dr. Rahman had an agenda. It's informed by a careful reading of the circumstances in which he finds himself. Exceptionality in the United States 
is, you know, to his advantage. On his return visit to the White House, Abdurrahman appealed to President Adams to contribute to the fund to free his children. Meetings with other politicians in the young capital had netted the prince several hundred dollars. When Abdurrahman made it clear that his true homeland was not in Morocco, President Adams was less charitable. May 22nd, 1828. The distraction of business and of visitors gave me a headache. Abdul Rahman, the emancipated Moor, brought me a subscription book to raise a fund for purchasing the freedom of his five sons and his eight grandchildren, to which I declined subscribing. John Quincy Adams, President. Adams' lack of interest in helping to fund his children's freedom dealt a harsh blow to Abdurrahman. But there was one last group he could turn to. The American Colonization Society was a powerful organization, aimed at exporting Christianity and settling America's free blacks in Africa. Thomas Gallaudet headed up the society's Connecticut office. Abdurrahman hoped Gallaudet would enlist its wealthy members to buy his family's freedom. Believing Abdurrahman to be a Christian, Gallaudet saw in him an opportunity to use the prince's notoriety to spread Christianity to Africa. Gallaudet went as far as to give Abdurrahman a Bible written in Arabic and asked him to write the Lord's Prayer. Many years later, it was discovered that what Abdurrahman had written was actually the Fatiha, the opening chapter of the Quran. This was a man who has a lot of faith and he's committed to his principles, but he knows how to get what he wants from the system. He has to tell a story that makes sense to the people he's talking to. So we don't know how much of what he said was just for them and how much was what he really thought in his own heart. Abdurrahman was unable to stop the spin of events in Mississippi. When reports of his northern travels reached Natchez, he was cast as an instigator, stirring up racial troubles with free blacks and abolitionists at the government's expense. I consider the contract entered into by the government through the agency of Henry Clay, Secretary of State, entirely violated. Prince has written several letters to my slaves stating he would procure their freedom. And if he returns here, or while he remains in the United States, I consider the said Prince my slave. Thomas Foster. Ungrateful blackguard. And slave owners didn't like to set slaves free. It undermined the whole system, it undermined the whole economy, it undermined their moral justification of slavery. Andrew Jackson, a slaveholder who once lived near Natchez, stepped up his plans to defeat John Quincy Adams in the 1828 presidential election. Abdurrahman became a flashpoint for scandal and slander during the campaign. Remember the plot of Adams and Clay to excite the prejudices of your northern brethren against the South by employing an emancipated Negro to electioneer for them? President Adams. He will get nary a vote down here. Marshock became a staunch voice for the Southerner Jackson. And he wanted to stay on good terms with Foster and other plantation owners. As a result, <laughs> he turned on Abdurrahman ah. with a vengeance. It's one L in ungrateful, if you please. After months on the road, Prince's physical health was failing. Fevers forced him to cancel appearances. Funding from the ACS came up short, and public support to buy his children's freedom dried up. Andrew Jackson of Tennessee had been elected president. He would take office in March of 1829. It just seemed advisable, perhaps, uh, to, uh, to get overseas at this point. The Jackson election was evidence of a deepening split in the country, and black Masons lost no time in rallying behind Abdurrahman, a powerful political force. The free blacks of Boston had invited Abdurrahman to their city. It would be his last appeal. <laughs> D. 
David Walker, one of the country's most respected and feared anti-slavery advocates, warmly welcomed the prince to the African Masonic Lodge. Back in New England, Rahman continued his resolute canvassing for assistance. In Hartford, he met Reverend Thomas Gallaudet, later the benefactor of education for the deaf who took up his cause. From his pulpit, Gallaudet preached the importance of Abdul Rahman's return to Africa. It would seem as if Providence had taken him under his peculiar care and destined him to be the means of opening to the very interior of Africa, a wide and ineffectual door for the diffusion of the gospel. I think I see Africa, he told another audience. Our worthy guest, Abdul Rahman, was by African natural enemies torn from country, religion, and friends. May God enable him to obtain so much of the reward of his labors as may purchase the freedom of his offspring. A salute and tribute to the complete success of the philanthropic undertakings of Prince Abdul Rahman and the Manumission Society. This token of respect, which this day you have been pleased to confer, will ever be held by me. Isabella, in grateful remembrance, it is time to leave this place. After 10 grueling months, Abdul Rahman and his wife, Isabella, had raised only half the funds needed to free their children. With heavy hearts, they made arrangements to leave the country for good. Do not be too hard on yourself. We did all we could do. Abdurrahman crossed the Atlantic Ocean yet again, this time on a passenger ship named the Harriet. Traveling in their best cabin, compliments of the United States government and the American Colonization Society. On March 18, 1829, after 40 years and a lifetime away, Abdul Rahman returned to Africa. Stepping ashore in Monrovia, Liberia, he laid down his prayer mat and openly bowed in prayer. As he planned his journey home to Timbo, his thoughts turned, as always, to his children. Please inform all my friends that I am in the land of my forefathers and that I expect my friends in America to use their influence to get my children for me and inform them of my arrival in the colony, Abdul Rahman. Abdul Rahman lived for four months before he contracted a fever and died at the age of 67. He would never see his beloved Futa Jalan or his children again.